Well, good morning. It's great to see you guys here. Um, let me start before we uh, jump into today's talk. Uh, Father, we thank you for this time, and we celebrate you in all things. You're high and lifted up. You're glorious, and uh, for our time here, we ask that you'd speak to us, challenge us, and help us to see the grace of God that we are always invited into. We love you today in Jesus' name, and everybody said... Amen. Today we're in a talk in this series, and uh, our talk is going to be called Pride and Duplicity. Pride and Duplicity. Turn to somebody and say duplicity. Just rolls off the tongue. Duplicity. Um, It's the kind of thing that we don't want to be marked by. We don't want to be marked in our lives by pride or duplicity, but sometimes we have those, and what do we do with it? Um, If you have a Bible, you can open with me to the book of Proverbs. If you don't, uh, you can follow along on the screen or in your sermon notes. Uh, But Proverbs chapter 11, verse 3 says this, The integrity of the upright guides them. But the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. I remember years ago, and I'm talking, you know, more than a decade, you know, we're close to two decades when I first kind of came across this term in this passage and it stood out for me. Um, and you know how sometimes when you're reading, something just kind of jumps out at you and just sticks with you and bothers you and it's like a, you know, a thorn to you. That term, duplicity, um, really stood out for me and and caused me to wrestle with it. And here's why. It's because I deal with duplicity. I don't want to, but I do. There are times that I want to do something in a certain way, and I don't carry it out. There are times that I'll pray about it, and then I don't carry it out. And there are times I don't want to do something, and I do it. I, I'll pray, Lord, help me to be more compassionate, and then I'll find myself miss opportunities to be compassionate. I'll want to be more generous and more um, gracious, and then honestly, I'm not trying to throw myself under the bus, but honestly, I'll find myself snapping quicker than I wanted to. I find in myself sometimes doing things that I didn't want to do, thinking things I didn't want to think. And sometimes I want to do something. I want to honor the Lord with my words or with my heart or my behaviors. And then I do something that is contrary to that. And I wrestle with that sense of duplicity at times. I don't know if you deal with that or not. Where you're like, I I want to stay on the course and always have the marks of integrity. And I always have the marks of graciousness. And always have the word of the Lord in my mouth. And not to you know, drift or not to have a faint thought. And sometimes we, we, we wrestle with that. And, um, and I remember years ago, um, coming across Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul talks about, uh, in Romans 7, he's talking about this dilemma that he feels at times. And he says, uh, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. And he says, what, what shall I do with that? And I, I took great encouragement in that there was, a, that there was struggle there too. I, do, you, do you deal with this in any context? Uh, you know, and, and what do we do with that? How do we walk through that? Um, the term duplicity came from a Hebrew term, salaf. And uh, this term salaf meant to twist or to make crooked. Um, and it had a root word that sounds the same way, just a variation in, in spelling, salaf, and uh, to mean to slip or slipperiness. The root of this, this term was often used of a bribe. Think about somebody that's going in a particular path, they're straight, but then something happens, a bribe in this context is put before them, and it causes them to slip. It causes them to become crooked. That which was straight is now crooked or bent. Uh, Sometimes in common vernacular, we'll use the phrase, I'm straight. Uh, Young people use that a lot. How are you doing? I'm straight. Uh, Do you need anything? No, I'm straight. And it's kind of this visual or this phrase that I'm good, I'm on target. And sometimes, you know, uh, we pray, we read the Bible, we go to church, we're doing our best, you know, to be straight, to have integrity, to be the kind of people, the man or the woman that God has called us to be. 
Sometimes a bribe of some sort, a temptation of some sort is put before us. and We didn't expect it, didn't see it. It's not what we wanted. It, sometimes it comes from within us. Sometimes it comes from within somebody else. And it just, God, bent us. A tendency, a leaning, where it's like, I'm, I'm not straight anymore. If you're like me, you're like, well, Lord, hold on, I'll, I'll take care of this one. And we're like, I'm going to straighten myself back out, but that becomes kind of problematic, and I'll do my best effort. But then it's like, well, that didn't get real straight. And then something else comes along, somebody irritates us. You have kids, and they're like always stomping on you, you know. And you're like, I'm a circle from them, you know. They're like, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like this is me. And it's like, where does that come from, Lord? Why am I tempted to snap? Why am I tempted to have uh, irritated feelings, even bitterness? Why doesn't forgiveness roll rapidly? Why doesn't um, purity come at all points, at all times? Why, why do I deal with being bent at times, and how do I deal with that? Um, if we look in the scriptures, I think the scriptures give us a lot about how things come to us in the realm of temptation, and I think we're all tempted. I don't think that's a young man's or a young woman's term. I think that we're all tempted. And, um, and regarding temptations, the bribe that the enemy puts before you, so to say, to bend you... Um, I'll say this before we unpack them. I think that for you and me, if we were to have a one-on-one conversation, the temptations that come to your life are very specific to you. The flip side of that is they are not specific at all. They are not unique at all. They're unique and specific to you, but they are common in their generality, being that the enemy tempts in the same fashion for just about every single one of us. And we see that from the scriptures. The first one, if you'll write in your notes, the first temptation. The first temptation that we see is Adam and Eve. And we kind of talked about Adam and Eve a little bit last week. Um, Adam and Eve, we see their temptation show up in Genesis chapter 3. And it says this in Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent, who was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made, he said to the woman, did God really say, pause right there, You know, it's kind of that entry point that the enemy will come and will try and distort what God has already said to you. God will say, you're my child, and he'll come and say, are you sure about that? Uh, God will say, I've got a plan for your life. And he'll say, are you sure about that? You know, try and distort what God has said into our lives. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it. Here's the consequence, or you'll die. And interesting, if he can't confuse what God said, then he certainly will try and confuse the outcome of your behaviors. And he says this, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. Pause right there. The reason, in my opinion, I'm just giving you my opinion, why he says you will not surely die is he's basically saying, look around. Who else is here? Who else is he going to do this with? He's not going to kill you off. I mean, come on, let's be rational about this. He ain't going to kill you off. You're the only ones here. He ain't going to want to start over. So you have confused to what he's saying. Somehow you're misinterpreting that. You're not surely going to die. And then he gives gives some kind of explanation here. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And then it says in verse 6, and this is kind of the context. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom... She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Now, if we pause for just a second, and we were to eliminate, like if we were to strip away some of the details that make this story so commonly told and visualized, being let's remove the serpent for a second. Let's remove Adam and Eve from this situation. Let's remove the perfect garden from a second. 
let's remove the tree and the apple. You know, I don't, it wasn't, I'm sure it wasn't an apple, but everybody draws it as an apple. You know, let's remove the common variables. What is the DNA of this moment? If you remove serpent, people, tree, fruit, remove all of that, the DNA of the moment is seeing that it's good for food, seeing that it's pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom. Now let's push into that. It's there in your notes, but it's something that you and I deal with as well. If you think about just the practical reality, hey, we need food. We all need food. And this thing that's right in front of me, I need food. So why wouldn't the Lord want me to have this? Because I need what it provides. Secondly, it's pleasing to the eye. Have you ever wrestled with this? You know, if God made it, why, why would it be bad if God made it? Like, God wouldn't make anything bad, right? Or bad for me. So if it exists, it must be, you know, green light on it. She looks at it as God made this, so it must be okay. And then the third thing, desirable for gaining wisdom we would be able to have what he wants us to have, but we don't currently have. Like, nobody would argue that God doesn't want you to have wisdom. God wants me to have wisdom, and if I don't have it, then this is a pathway to me having it. And it would make sense, like if I look at it just very generically, that I would get the very things that, two things, that I need, and two, cause me to worship. Like food, he provides me. The blessing, the beauty of everything that he's created. The wisdom that he gives. And I would have the opportunity to grab hold of that. Do you ever find yourself, honestly, and you don't have to show your hand, but honestly, do you ever justify to yourself a set of behaviors that you know are not what you've been instructed to do, but you have a detailed explanation as to why it's justified? Like, for instance, anger. God, I'm, um, I'm angry, but honestly, the reason I'm angry is that person did A, B, and C, and I, maybe this is a righteous anger, you know, and we kind of justify the anger. Uh, maybe it's a retaliation or an unforgiveness. God, I, I understand unforgiveness, but what they did was morally improper, and I just I cannot forgive them. We give some kind of justification. Um, here's a tough one, and um, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about your neighbor here. Uh, is envy, where we envy what somebody else has. Uh, the Bible uses the word covet, where I covet what they have. Um, and we justify it. You know, I work just as hard as they do. You know, we've been trying to get pregnant for years and years and years and can't. And they do, they look at each other and end up with a baby. And you covet. And you can justify some things that you feel. Um, you can justify eating chocolate cake at one in the morning, right? It's, it's good for food. It's pleasing to the eye. I would certainly be wiser for eating it, right? I'm joking with that, obviously. But have you, honestly, and this can be your neighbor too, um, have you ever justified doing something to relieve stress that you know is wrong? Yeah. So the details of what we live with sometimes are specific to us, but the temptation that comes to us is very, very common. That it'll be good for food, it'll be pleasing to the eye, it'll be desirable for gaining wisdom. This is the exact same template that plays out in Jesus' temptation. Like if we jump from the Old Testament to the New Testament, first book in the Bible, or first book in the New Testament, we have Matthew. And in Matthew, we get some fantastic things. Matthew talks about the genealogy of Jesus. If you've ever read the genealogy and you're like, oh, skip, 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 why do I need to know that? The whole purpose of the genealogy is to trace Jesus through the Messiah line, to uh, confirm that he came from the line of the prophesied uh, Messiah family line. And then you get, you get the birth, and then you get the baptism, and then you get his teachings, and then you get the miracles. Matthew talks about all that. Matthew talks about his betrayal. He talks about his death. He talks about his resurrection. He talks about his ascension back to heaven. Matthew talks about a lot of stuff. 
He also talks about this one engagement before Jesus ever had public ministry where Jesus fasts and prays for 40 days. He is not eating for 40 days, and then he is tempted. It's fascinating that the enemy, Satan, comes to tempt Jesus. And interestingly enough, he tempts Jesus in the same way that he tempted Adam and Eve. The wording is specific to him. The generality is the same. Jesus has been fasting for 40 days. Please don't miss this. Please don't read this with like rose-colored goggles. Jesus is human, and that's part of what is fascinating. He is both God and human, and he bore the marks of humanity. He had fasted for 40 days, and so he had the appearance and the hunger of what would come with fasting for 40 days. Don't just see him as just kind of cruising through the desert. I'm good. 40 days, nothing. He was hungry. He was weary. So much so that the enemy comes to him and says, you need food. Why don't you just turn that stone into bread? I mean, you have the ability. You deserve it. Why don't you do it? And Jesus, you know, Jesus responds with, man shall not live by bread alone, but by on every, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It was good for food. But he says, I'm not going to answer that one. Uh, the next one is he takes him up to this high mountain or high, high point of the temple. And he says, if you'll throw yourself down, surely, surely the angels will capture you and you won't even dash your foot. I mean, imagine 40 days of weariness and you're a little disheveled and you're trying to, you know, make sense of things and you're on target with things. And he's basically saying the very same thing that he says to Adam and Eve. Like with Adam and Eve, hey, look around. Who is he going to go to? There's nobody else. He's not going to start over. I mean, he, you're not going to die. He's saying with Jesus, you know, look around. Who else is the Messiah? You, you, nothing's going to happen to you, certainly. He says, try it, just jump. And Jesus gives the very famous, you know, statement that we shall not put the, the Lord our God to the test. And then the third thing that he tempts him with is he takes him up onto the mountain and he says, look out over the kingdoms. I'll give you all the kingdoms if you'll just simply bow down and worship. This is very intriguing to me because he's fasting and praying and what is ahead of him post fasting and praying is three years of ministry, loving people, being abandoned by people, Working miracles, being accused of those miracles, and ultimately the period at the end of the sentence is they're going to betray you and they're going to crucify you. And it's all so that people can be redeemed and atoned and the glory of God would be one for the Father. And uh, Satan is basically saying, instead of going through all that, I can give it to you right now. Well, I mean, we can, short, we can shortcut this. Honestly, Honestly, have you ever been tempted by the shortcut? Like, you know God promised something to you. You're not mistaken about that, and you're not ambitious in that. But God promised something to you. And in some regards, you feel like you deserve it. And you come face to face with an opportunity to get what he has already said will be yours. And you feel in some capacity you deserve. And he says, but not yet. That's hard. That's partly what happened. This is in my notes, but that's partly what happened to Jonah. In the book of Jonah, he's told to go preach against the city of Nineveh and the wickedness. Well, God had already said he's going to destroy him. And he felt like we deserve being vindicated. And he came to this point of what God has promised and what we feel like we've earned. And it's right there. But you're saying not yet. And I'd rather grab it than wait. It's very interesting that the same pattern that happened for Adam and Eve also happens for Jesus as well. Hungry from fasting, the height of the temple, looking out over the kingdoms. And you jump into one more temptation, and that's, so you can write this in your notes, it's our temptation. I think for every single one of us, we fall into what we're about to read. Every single one of us, save none. And uh, scripture says this in 1 John chapter 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and then he gives these three components. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. And you see these three components, not just of Adam and Eve. You see it of Jesus. I see it also 
of what will be in front of me. And I think will be in front of you. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. If you feel something in on lust of the flesh, you can put a term there in your notes, appetites. I think when we have the temptation of certain appetites, things we want, things we need, um, certainly it's easy for people to frame in our culture lust of the flesh as a sexual thing. I think it goes far beyond that. Um, It certainly might be desires of some form of physicality, but physical or any kinds of desires via sinful paths. And there's lots of different avenues that have nothing to do with, you know, sensuality or sexuality. But an appetite. Do you, do you ever find in yourself, I have an appetite for something. Like, um, I have an appetite for retaliation. Like when somebody wrongs me, it's like I can't, I can't get that taste out of my mouth until I've, I've, I've justified what, my response, or tell, you know, they're not going to do me that way. Or um, I want something, and I, I need something, and I have an appetite for it. It's a dangerous thing. The second thing, the lust of the eyes, we could put the word ambition, ambitions. Um, and this is an interesting one for us, uh, ambitions. Um, it's coveting, and I used that word earlier. It's coveting what isn't ours. Um, this is a hard one, and this is one that people, if we could just be real mature about this for a second, this is something that most people won't ever notice inside of us. They'll never see us. Some of the lust of the flesh things, they watch the behaviors. They can check your history report. They can wear, watch your GPA, GPS tracker, where you went. Uh, the coveting thing, it's hard to detect. It's hard to track. But I watch somebody, and I want what they have. I'll push into a hard one for some of us as parents where somebody else's kid gets an opportunity in favor and ours don't and our kids have a hard road and you covet that. You covet that for your kid. Uh, One kid is succeeding and your kid is failing and I'm not talking grades, I'm just talking in general. And you covet their success. And you wouldn't want to take success from somebody, but I covet something. I covet, uh, some people covet somebody's marriage. Like I look at my marriage, and I think my marriage is just so-so, or maybe even not even so-so. We're so-so on a good day. And I watch somebody else, and they just seem like they have a fantastic go. And I covet what they have. And I don't pour into this, because maybe it's you, maybe it's me, but I just wish I was this, or I wish... It's an interesting thing, these ambitions. But you have that term, lust of the eyes. This week I was thinking about that, and um, I felt like I felt like the Lord brought me to Matthew chapter 6 in thinking about this. Here's the context before I show you the verse. Jesus is talking about, and this is going to feel like it doesn't even connect to our talk. He's talking about money. He's talking about finances. This is the section in Matthew 6 where he says, don't store up for yourselves treasures in the earth, but rather store up for yourself treasure in heaven where moth and rust don't, you know, don't impact it. And he says at the end of it, he's going to say, no, no one can serve two masters. You can't serve both God and money. And it's just a big passage on finance and your heart and whatnot. And in the middle of it, in the middle of it, he adds these two statements here, Matthew 6, 22. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? He inserts that right in the middle of this money talk, and it's like, that doesn't even make sense. Until, until... You see that word I up there, and you see in the Greek that term I was not talking about a biological type I. It's talking about, it's a term that carried the idea of ambitious vision. If the ambitious vision is dark, then your whole path will be dark. If the ambitious vision is light, then your whole path will be light. And then it does make sense in the context of finances. You think in your life and my life, you know, what are those ambitions? Um, Truthfully, 
and I'll talk to the guys on this side so y'all can hear, and I'll talk to the guys on this side so you guys can hear. But as guys, we often look at where our life is, and it's not where we thought it would be. It doesn't match the ambitious vision that's inside our eye. It could be financially, we're not where we thought we'd be. It could be the leadership of our family that's not where it should be. It could be our own personal integrity, and we wrestle as men, as men. I'll be, the, I'll be our spokesman. We wrestle with duplicity at times, and, um, and what do we do with that? Uh, it's important to know how the enemy will come and will attack or will tempt. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and then this last one's the pride of life. And you could write this in, assurances. And, um, and you could also put in parentheses another word, confidence. Um, the boasting of honor or inflating self, uh, this, this, am, this assurance. And you see up there on the screen a Greek term, aslon. And um, this is what's interesting to me. I found this to be fascinating this week. Where you have pride of life, the term pride is a Greek term in there, in the, in the Greek language. There's a term that commonly isn't used for pride. We read it pride of life, but it's a word that commonly was used of boasting. This is more a term or phrase around boasting, where you have an, a disorder in your boasting. A wrongfully aligned boasting. Have you ever watched somebody who walks with a false arrogance? You know, they boast about themselves, they boast about their life, and you're like, that ain't gonna hold you from sickness. That ain't gonna hold you from collapse. But there's this this false sense of boasting, this arrogance. Um, You you guys, you know, a number of you probably know this. Last year, Uh, In February, my daughter, one of my daughters was in a softball game and broke her leg. Broke her leg in five places. We ended up in the ER. Uh, She ended up in surgery. Her leg was going in two different directions. And and after the surgery, she was up in a room. My wife was up in the room. And I went down to the cafe uh, to get some food for for us. And and I had this very, very weird thought. I'll, I'll admit it right now that it was weird. Uh, when I was walking through the hallways, there were a lot of people in this kind of lobby area, a lot of people in the hallways, and I just kind of had this epiphany just in this moment that every single person here, every single one of us, were there in regard to brokenness in some form or fashion, sickness, bruising, whether they were sick or whether they were there visiting someone sick or they were there working in order to help somebody who was sick or broken. We weren't even close to the labor and delivery, so I was like, that's pretty accurate, you know, here. Labor and delivery, everybody's celebrating. But I was like, everybody here is here for brokenness. And this was the weird thought that I had. How arrogant and how utterly distasteful would it be if in the midst of all this, I just started kind of skipping and say, ha, ha, ha. I'm not sick like you are. I'm not broken like you are. If someone were to do that, and you're there with a sick family member, or a broken family member, or you were broken or sick yourself, it would be so utterly distasteful to hear that or observe that. And God says, I can't stand pride. If you think about it in the context of boasting, he can't stand the false boasting. When you're going through life and you're like, I'm better than you are. I've got more than you have. My path is better and easier than yours is. And we're tempted. We're tempted to the pride of life. We're tempted to look around us and boast in something that we've done rather than what God has done. We're tempted to boast in the square footage of the house that we have provided. Or we're tempted to boast in how well we've done on the job. Or we're tempted to boast in what we've accumulated. Or we're tempted to boast in a lot of different things. The temptation for you and me will be specific in detail, but it'll be very general in how it comes. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. And it leads to our times, our feelings, of Proverbs 11.3, of duplicity. Now, what do we do with that? 
What do you and I do with that? Well, I come back to Romans chapter 7. And what did Paul say? We started off with it. We didn't read the verse. But what did Paul say about it? He said this in Romans chapter 7. He said, so I find this law at work. And he is examining himself. He has the spotlight on himself, not on somebody else. He says, when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. And then he asks a very interesting question. You and I say it just with different wording. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Like, I wanted to be here and somebody came in and bent me. What do I do with that? Who will rescue me from this reality? And he comes to this answer that you and I, at some point, have got to continuously land on. And he says this. He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, at the end of the day, it always comes back to me coming to the Lord. Earlier in Matthew 6, he had said, what shall we do? Shall we keep on sinning? And he said, God forbid. I tell you, I have watched and I have had one-on-one conversations with people that have bent by their own things or bent by somebody else and have said, you know, why even try? Why do I keep? Because I find that I keep failing. I find that I keep being angry. I find that I keep lusting. Or I find that I keep drifting into the same set of behaviors. Why should I keep trying? And Paul would say, God forbid that we continue to keep sinning. God forbid that we would give up. But what is our answer? Do we look to ourselves? Do we look to our own strength? He says, no, who will rescue me from this scenario? Thanks be to God. And then he continues and he says this. He says in verse 8, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, in the book of Luke... uh, it's speaking of, um, it's speaking of uh, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist says of Jesus, he says this in Luke 3, verse 5, he says, the crooked roads shall become straight. You know, I don't, I, I don't know how to make this or this into this. But Jesus can make all things new. Jesus has the ability to forgive you. Jesus has the ability to restore you. Jesus is the one in whom we come to. Now listen to me, because I'm close to landing the plane today. I don't have a talk today in the measure of duplicity. I don't have a do an A, B, and C, the one, two, three, and you will never deal with that again. You'll never deal with that strained thought or strained feeling or, you know, you'll never be tempted with lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. My message is simply this. Come to Jesus. If you deal with temptation in any regard, come to Jesus. If you look in your life and you're bothered in any context by a measure of pride or duplicity, come to Jesus. If you look at your appetites and you're like, that appetite keeps getting me. Um, If you look at your ambitions and you're honest about what you have and what you don't have and what you covet and what you envy and what's down inside of you and where you're dissatisfied. If you look at your assurances. What do we have confidence in? Like what's holding us up? What are the support beams in our house? If you question those assurances, come to Jesus. If you've been bent because of your own things, what's inside of you, or if you've been bent because somebody else did it to you, come to Jesus. My message simply is this. Come to Jesus. And I'll say, I'll say this, I'll be very honest about this. This is so much easier to preach than to live. It is really easy to put on a microphone, make sure the batteries work, click it on, talk for a little bit, then click it off and walk off the stage. It's really easy to talk about truth. It's harder to live truth. And the reason is because of time. 
Like we're only in here for 35 minutes or so with me talking. Hopefully I haven't worn you out. But you're going to go live your life way beyond 35 minutes. The other thing is you're not exhausted. Where maybe later in this week you're going to find yourself exhausted. Maybe at the end of the day you're going to find yourself exhausted. Maybe you're going to get weary at some point this week. And then there's other people. Like right now, you're all looking at me and listening to me. Nobody has verbally attacked me. Nobody has physically attacked me. Thank you for that. Um, But this week, maybe somebody accosts you verbally. Maybe somebody shortchanges you. Maybe somebody steps on your straight bar and they bend you. And it's harder to live it. My answer is still come to Jesus. He is always going to be the answer for us. And I will say this. There is no expiration date. There is no expiring of how many times you can come to Jesus. There is no limit that you will exhaust that it's like, well, I used up all ten of my goes. You will always find an invitation and you will always find good company at the cross. You'll find people like Paul who are saying, thanks be to God through our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, because there is now no condemnation. This morning, I thought we'd close in a time of prayer. And if in any regards you struggle with your appetites, your ambitions, your pride, your assurances, your confidences, I would just simply ask you to maybe use my words or use your own words. And right where you are, come to Jesus. Will you stand to your feet with me as we pray? Father, this morning we come before you. And we thank you that in all things, Lord, there's an invitation to the cross. Just do me a favor. Just lift your hands up just real quick. We'll just do this for a few seconds. Lord, we just come to you right now with all the temptations that we deal with, where we stand strong and where we're weak, when we're on it and when we miss it, when we get bent by our own doings and when we get bent by other people. Lord, you can make the crooked straight, and so we come to you today. Lord, would you make our heart straight? Would you make our soul straight? Would you make our mind straight? Would you help us to be wise to how the enemy will try and, try and bribe us into something, try and make us crooked or slippery? But Lord, help us to receive your grace. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, just thank him right where you are in your own words, in your own whisper. Just thank him. If you are not in Christ Jesus today and you've never made Jesus your Lord, leader, savior of your life, would you do so today? And just say this with me, if that's you and you've never done this, say, Jesus, today by faith I receive you. I invite you to be Lord and leader of my life. I receive by faith that there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. I receive forgiveness today for my sin. Give me a new heart, a new life, a new soul. Help me to follow you with my life from this day forward. Father, thanks for this time together. Would you bless your people as we prepare to go and may the light of Christ always shine through our lives. We give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.